Welcome to I Could Murder a Podcast. We are back once again, and I'm joined by the insufferably inconsistent, the intolerably indifferent, the ineffective imbecile, Ben Carter. How you doing? Wow, that Whoa. one was really fucking nasty, man. That was sharp. I could have done more. There's more I words that I could have went with, but <laughs> yeah. I actually... No, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. Um, yeah, but doing really well, thank you. Idiot. Thank you. Um, yeah, doing really well, thank you. Probably got the whole population on my side now because of that introduction. So thank you so much for that. I don't know. I, I know. Some of your views. Some of your views, mm. mate. I don't no, know. No, not, not sure about that. Uh, but yeah, doing really well. Um, great to be back with another episode. We're back in the main channel flow. Oh, episode two. Wow. We're flying. How you doing, Dad? I'm very good because I'm braving the non-hat today. I think you've noticed. Um, mm. For those of you who don't know, I had a hair transplant late last year and it's just about popped through. So I thought, do you know what? I'm going to fuck off the hat and show you the real me. It's bedding in lovely, Dan. Thank you very much. I'm very excited for today, not only for the case, but for Tom's impression that's going to come inevitably. My impressions all could be the same thing. They have a very fine line <laughs> that's between what makes mine. It brilliant. Your Peterson is good, though. That's the true thing, because yeah. quotes will be up Dan Street today, but you do a good Peterson. Um, mm. So I'm torn. I am torn. I'll give you a couple of quotes, Tom, today. Uh, on the Minnesotes, um, yesterday, uh, Ben made me do the quote and my accent went through a, a lot of different regions of America very quickly. So, oh, wow. uh, but yes, we'll see. But yes, we are back once again. Uh, welcome back. This is a, a big case. It's a case that I, it's, it's a case I hold um, quite high up in my true crime rankings, basically. I know a lot of people find the documentary very convoluted, uh, overly long, or like I've heard people complaining about it, but I'm completely the opposite. I, I find the documentary incredibly intriguing. It is, of course, the case of Michael Peterson, the staircase killer. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm the same as you. I think it's a, it's a, well, you, did you not say that making, you found making a murderer quite slow? Yeah. Yeah, I find, I, I like the staircase. I enjoy it. I rewatched it over Christmas, but I do find it a little bit slow. I can understand why people do critique it that way, but I, I really enjoy it, really rate it. I'm, it's up there with the jinx for me. Very sort of similar. Dan, have you seen The Staircase? Yeah, I have seen it and I enjoyed it. And although it's long, it didn't feel long because Michael Peterson is such a character. Mm -mm. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. We're obviously going to de delve right into Michael Peterson as a character, as a person. But I think for me, what I liked of The Staircase, thinking about the Making Murder, I felt like they, they went over the same things a lot. Yeah. It felt like a lot of filler. Whereas with The Staircase, it spans over a long amount of time, obviously. Uh, you have you have unimaginable access to the whole case, which I think is very new. And even seeing the reaction to some of the um, the victim's family to the documentary later on when they revisit it is, is, is something I've never seen before within the documentary. So yeah, it's a very intriguing one. I'm very excited to kind of see what you guys think of it and obviously hear what you guys, the audience as well, think of it. We'll be popping up a question over on Spotify to hear what you guys think. But yeah, shall we... Uh... <laughs> Walk up the stairs, guys, and to look at this case at the top of the stairs, but be careful when you're doing it. Ooh, ooh, what's that? <laughs> oh, references. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That was a hoot hoot, by the way, wasn't it? Just a cheeky little default owl. bird. Yeah, cheeky little owl. The Michael Peterson case has sparked intense debate and speculation among legal experts, journalists, and the general public all over the world. Peterson, once a member of the US military, a novelist and a former mayoral candidate, was at the centre of a highly publicised trial following the controversial death of his wife, Kathleen Peterson, in late 2001. Her body was found lying at the bottom of a staircase in their home, with several severe wounds that many have suggested could only have been inflicted by a third party. The division surrounding the case stems from conflicting evidence, including theories about whether Kathleen's death was the result of a tragic accident or a deliberate act. The Michael Peterson case remains, to date, a polarising subject, having been placed under the microscope by a Netflix series and a subsequent dramatisation, both of which invited ongoing scrutiny and differing opinions about what truly transpired on that fateful December night. Before we start, I mean, especially probably you, Dan, because um, you haven't been involved within the research, I think we've done cases before where one of us have a particular opinion and by the end of the episode it is slightly changed. Do you have like a clear stance in terms of what you believe i'm obviously going to go into but i don't have to say what you think happened in that night but in terms of peterson guilty or not guilty just do we'll just say that it's not clear but guilty interesting interesting, interesting. 
Mm, very interesting. But yes, yeah, so we're not going to, you know, any spoilers for anyone who hasn't heard of this. We will obviously, we're going to go into the case in depth like we always do. And yeah, as I said, I'd love to hear what you guys, the audience, think of this. Because I think, as Ben's kind of put it within that, that text there, it is one that really people disagree on. I think yeah. a lot of the key the key evidence, I'll, I'll do that in quotation marks, key evidence used <laughs> is very questionable. A lot of things used by the prosecution is very questionable. And um, some people would say some of the defence is questionable, but obviously we'll get into it. I think, yeah, I think that's the interesting part about this case, and it'll be a fantastic one if if you're listening or watching this episode and you are not familiar with it because you're in for a treat. It's on Netflix still today, and I I haven't seen the dramatisation. Is it Colin Firth playing yeah. Michael? Don't they reenact certain scenarios in it? Is that right? They do the three possible, well, the, the, the three main theories of what happened that night. They show kind of what they could have been, which is quite yeah. interesting. I started watching a couple of them and stopped and then I thought, no, I'll give it another go. I think because Michael Peterson is such a character, yeah. it kind of felt sometimes like it was a bit of a, what's the word when you do, just an impression of him. Mm. But um, it probably is worth a watch. It's a very good cast. I know a lot of the Peterson family take a lot of umbrage towards that particular thing and they, well, they refuse to watch it, but from the things they've heard, they think this it's just obviously dramatised, which obviously is a drama. But I would say this case... There's so much to it. It doesn't need anything added to it. Yeah. Like a winding staircase, Dan. Umbro. It's like a room with stairs. I don't know. There's a painting, isn't there? A room with stairs all over the shop. Yeah. And yeah. Like, you go any way and look at it at a different angle. Well, there's an interesting painting at the bottom of the staircase as well. Um, so painting within a painting. But I, I'll hit for some balance right now. I'll say, and I won't go into why, I disagree with Dan. Mm. But I can completely see why Dan has that stance. It's one of those cases, isn't it? It's one of those staircases. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm excited to go through this one with you boys. Sorry for disagreeing. <laughs> I'm actually going to be slightly in the middle of this because I, I probably do lean towards more like Ben's angle in terms of thinking innocent. But at the same time, there's a little nagging doubt, mm. a little annoying little voice in the back of my head, mm. shrieking, screaming when I'm trying to sleep at night, going, is it? <laughs> and I just, yeah, I haven't slept for four days. Um, but hopefully today I can, you know, come up with an idea of what I think and then we'll we'll put it to rest. But yeah, it's a fascinating one. So let's not waste any more time and let's do what I always do. Start off with a little quote from Michael Peterson. And Dan, if you want to do an impression of him, feel free. I didn't do anything. I, <coughs> I can't commit to that. <laughs> the c- cartoon janitor. <laughs> I would have got away with it too. <laughs> I think you should have a go. Give, give, give me the first line of Michael Peterson. You do do a good one, yeah. I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. I didn't harm Kathleen. We have all suffered enough already. Let's end it. I just want to end it right now. Enough is enough. We've all suffered enough, and that that wonderful, awful line in Romeo and Juliet. This is fantastic. All so good. are punished. I mean, I don't know what we are punished for. I don't know why we children have to suffer with it why they were being punished but i did feel that line let this end right now but i did feel that line <laughs> that was so good. good what a finish the quote that tom did yesterday he was basically trying to pin a crime on an elephant and the quote was about a paragraph and a half long and <laughs> so long. <laughs> but that was that was very good he does That's do a excellent. good michael peterson well and done. i'm sure the regular listeners will know because michael peterson has popped up in a lot of our previous episodes it's kind of like an old craggly owen wilson <laughs> Wow. 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 Right. wow. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I think probably Dan should take the quotes. So, because it's quite a serious case. Uh, yeah. So, we can leave that as it is, I guess. That's fantastic. This case predominantly revolves around two individuals, though a third will definitely become apparent as we move through our background. These two are Michael and Kathleen Peterson. So, we'll explore Michael's background before moving into a detailed timeline of events. Uh, and then, as we've kind of hinted at, we can move to a form of conclusion and give our verdicts on this particular case. As Tom said, everyone seems to have a, a differing or ever changing opinion on the case. So, it's, yeah, it's a really interesting and unique one. And um, yeah, there's a lot about his background that also I didn't manage to find from the documentary, but I found in articles about him. And yeah, it just confuses me even more about this case. So I can, yeah, I want to get on that fence with Tom, but I don't think there's any room. I think that's a good point about the documentary. It's, it's, it doesn't do the whole early life and things like that. It just starts from literally from the the crime scene or uh, accident scene. 
it doesn't delve into this. So yeah, a lot of the stuff we'll be talking about today will be new information for people who've just seen the documentary and maybe it will paint a slightly different picture in their minds. But yes, we're going to start off like we always do with the early life of Michael Ivor Peterson. So he was born on the 23rd of October 1943 on the outskirts of Nashville, Tennessee. He was the oldest of four children born to Eugene Ivor Peterson and Eleanor Bartolino, having two younger brothers, William and John, as well as one younger sister called Anne. Michael's father, Eugene, worked in multiple low to mid-level roles for the US military, and it is here that he would meet Michael's mother, Eleanor, whilst he was stationed in Austria during the late 1930s. Eleanor eventually moved to America with Eugene in order to flee Europe before the outbreak of World War II, where the pair quickly got married and began to work on raising a family of their own. Michael was born first, followed four years later by William in 1947. Another four years passed by and John was born in 1951, before, finally, Anne was born in 1953. We'll explore the relationships with all the siblings, particularly Anne, who has caused quite a bit of stir within the Peterson family later in our timeline. The Petersons were considered very much a middle-class family and there were very few issues that we've been able to uncover uh, regarding Michael's childhood. For the first four years of his life, due to his father Eugene working as a military officer, the family had to relocate on a regular basis all over America, occasionally staying in temporary accommodations but also living on barracks in different parts of southern and eastern America. This did impact Michael's ability to make friends with other children and maintain relationships. However, he would go on to say that when his younger siblings were born, this made it much easier as they essentially became four best friends. As he grew older, Michael would spend almost all of his free time, as well as the time his family spent traveling across the country, reading books. He became obsessed with the works of Ernest Hemingway and would heavily immerse himself in a great number of his works, becoming an avid reader in the process. A young Michael noticed how Hemingway was famous all over the country and that everybody he spoke with about the author only had positive things to say. Even from before reaching his teenage years, he wanted a similar career and life for himself. And so he began writing short stories and exploring works of fiction. Whilst his siblings would often go out and explore the various new neighbourhoods that they moved to, Michael would always have his head in a book. And he seemed to mature faster than a large number of children his age as a result. So yeah, I think he was very much an, uh, a young introvert. He, he wouldn't socialize as much as his siblings. He didn't have kind of that maybe early sense of adventure. And he would often remain indoors reading and writing instead of going out with his friends. Very much a bookworm. Yeah, I could see that. Well, I've, I've seen it, yeah. According to Michael's brother, his interest in books pretty much grew into an obsession. If he wanted to learn about a specific subject or research something that he had overheard, he would drop what he was doing and immediately head to the local library. A bit like Matilda in um the opening of that film. His love for books helped him develop a great deal of knowledge, which proved to be an excellent support for him at school. He attended Hampton High School in Vancouver, with Michael being regarded as an above average student in all of his classes. I mean, just the way Michael comes across in interviews, he, he does seem very studious and very intelligent, doesn't he? I think that's one thing you can say, like in a lot of long documentaries, you can you feel like the people are trying to be clever and trying to outwit. I don't think Michael ever comes across as I mean, that's the big thing, isn't it? I think he comes across as very, like, he, he's just very on the money in terms of what he's saying. And he, it, and if anything, some things he says gets him in trouble because he's so mm. emotional with how he says, says things at times. He just says it as he sees it. And I never feel he's been disingenuous from what I see, but. That's really interesting because I feel the opposite. Yeah. I feel like he has got a front. He is hiding a lot of stuff with the, with the way he talks, but yeah. He is a man who is, we'll go on to it, it's a big, it's a big turning point in the case, is hiding things, but at the same time, I don't know. I think that's the thing with him, it's people really have a set opinion on him, it seems. Not much else is known about Michael's upbringing and personal life for his formative years. He was said to be shy, but friendly and very introverted as a teenager. He went on to attend the prestigious Duke University in North Carolina, from where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in political science in 1965. Whilst at the university, Michael seemed to come out of his shell a little more, but still had a remarkable work ethic towards his studies. He was president of the Sigma Nu Fraternity and was also the editor of The Chronicle, the daily student newspaper for a year. He and a small group of friends also began to attend classes at the law school of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Yeah, so I, I, this Duke University, for what Michael went on to achieve in his uh, writing career, I thought, okay, well, I'd not, I'd not heard of Duke University, so maybe that was ignorant of me, but I did do a little look in, and I've got something for both of you. Benny's tits, give him a listen. So notable alumni from Duke University, Apple CEO, Tim Cook, former US President, Richard Nixon, Bill Gates' ex-wife, Melinda Gates, although she's not just known as Bill Gates' ex-wife. And I thought, Tom, you would like this one. Uh, the leading cinematographer for the Wes Anderson movies, uh, Robert Yeoman. There you go. Which one was for Dan? 
Bill, Bill Gates's ex-wife. Some astronauts. Some astronauts. Some, some high-ranking astronauts, Brilliant. not like Buzz or Neil, but there was another pretty big name. Go on. Astronaut. What is it? Uh, <laughs> he's not, it was like, it, it wasn't famous astronaut, but it was oh, an astronaut. And I still thought Dan liked space. I do like space. And I also know Dan absolutely loves the Hangover movies. Ken Jong uh, also went there. We did watch all of them last week. <laughs> oh, he actually does love them. Brilliant. Did you actually? Yeah. <laughs> it's a very unnew movie, I would have thought. It yeah. is, yeah. We enjoyed them, though, actually. So. Wow. so Ken Jong, Dan, very intelligent guy. Yeah. Despite the, the roles that he takes. Yeah. Um, very intelligent, yeah. Very good. So something for everyone, really, there. Definitely. Cheers. Now, there are some claims that have emerged surrounding Michael's time at university, though these claims would only really start coming to light much later in his life when the allegation of murder was placed before him. Uh-oh. Some anonymous male alumni of Duke University claimed that they would experiment with their sexuality and that Michael was often a keen participant. Though Michael would keep these experiences to himself, his siblings and close friends seemed to notice that Michael may have been either gay or bisexual. Once he graduated, Michael began studying law at North Carolina in the hopes of obtaining a master's degree, but he would eventually drop out for unknown reasons. Upon doing so, he took up his first proper employment at the age of 22, where he worked as a research assistant for the US Department of Defense. And his first key assignment was to research arguments that supported increased military involvement from America in the Vietnam War. He also briefly held an analyst role as part of a government think tank that also surrounded the Vietnam War. And yeah, these roles, this time that he spent, um, I, I would imagine surrounding similar minded people, um, very much influenced Michael um, at this point in his life. And as a result, he became very pro-war and even voluntarily enlisted in the US Marine Corps. His first deployment was at an airbase called, and hopefully producer Dan can help us here. Rhine Main Air Base. I can't even say the English word. <laughs> Rhine Main Air Base in Grafenhausen. Love that. Wow, nice. And this was over in West Germany. And it was here that he met and later married a lady called Patricia Sue, who was an elementary school teacher at the base. Patricia and Michael were both 23 at the time of their marriage, and the pair went on to have two children together, both boys, Clayton and Todd. And later on, like, when, because uh, within the documentary, I'm going to keep referring back to the documentary. Patricia and Michael does not, they don't seem um, to make sense in my head as, as, as a couple. They are okay. very different people. The, the energies in the room, it seems, uh, I'd say she's more um, spiritual in a way. A bit more bohemian. Yeah, he's very down the line. In 1968, Michael served in the Vietnam War, where he would see various levels of combat over the next four years before being honorably discharged at the rank of captain in 1971 on medical grounds. This was apparently due to a car accident that occurred when he had been shipped over to Japan, which left him with a permanent physical disability. During his service, Michael claimed to have been awarded with two Purple Hearts, a Silver Star, and a Bronze Star with Valor. Though he had the medals to prove it, he did not have the documentation that typically accompanies them. More on these claims shortly. Yeah, so I thought I would have a... Because the documentary do mention briefly his, his military uh, career. And I did want to have a quick look in this because I found it interesting. I looked at History Hub historyhub.org, as well as the National Archives for the medical records and honourable discharges during the Vietnam War for soldiers that apparently there's quite a few that found themselves or were transferred over to Japan. But the information is really, really limited, specifically around Michael, um, which we'll, we'll elaborate on a little bit more. So although he was, it was proven he was legitimately honourably discharged, there is a chance, um, especially if you're on the side of guilt within this case and you feel that he is a kind of a shady individual that he may have embellished the reason for his discharge especially if you consider what happened in his later career and obviously he was a, he went on to be a novelist you can be honorably discharged on physical grounds or on psychological grounds and the national archives said the following regarding medical records of american soldiers treated in japan although nara has official reports of the activities of the u.s army hospitals during the vietnam war these records do not include information about individual patients in many cases personnel records were destroyed in the 1973 fire proof of service can be provided from other records such as morning reports payrolls and military orders and a certificate of military service will be issued after he was honorably discharged, Michael retired from the military and moved back to West Germany to be with his family, where the family would live for the next several years. Here he would begin writing about his experience in the Vietnam War, and he wrote his first novel, The Immortal Dragon, which I swear, isn't that a band? Let's imagine dragons, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah. Sorry about that. More dragon, I think, is like makes you think of Mortal Kombat. Yeah, some sort of finisher, finisher. or a character. Yeah, an honourable discharge. I have, a, I have another character. <laughs> or a finisher. Oh, well, yeah, it, it well. Which became a bestseller and encouraged him to seek a career in writing. During this time, the Peterson family befriended another American couple living in the area, George and Elizabeth Ratliff. Now, George and Elizabeth also had two young children, both girls, Martha and Margaret, and both families became very close and formed a strong relationship. So they were, they were also neighbours, they lived very close together. And both mothers worked at the same elementary school, whilst George was also a captain. But instead of for the, uh, the Marines, he was actually part of the US Air Force. And sadly, George would pass away as the result of a heart attack in 1983 whilst serving on a mission in Panama. This left Elizabeth and her two daughters understandably devastated. Rumours and allegations, which are very much a running theme in this case, would again begin to spread regarding Michael and this particular period of his life. It is speculated that despite Elizabeth and Michael's wife Patricia being the best of friends, that Michael and Elizabeth may have engaged in an affair. Either way, friction began to appear between Michael and Patricia to the point that it caused him, uh, according to Michael, to consider moving him and his sons back to America. Sadly, not too long after George would pass away, Elizabeth also sadly would pass away, leaving behind her two young children. The family's been very close. Uh, Michael actually would go on to ad adopt the two children. He would also see receive the estate from, from the family as well. So he had a bit, a bit of money from the estate as well to look after the girls. So Margaret and Martha, who were very young at the time, lived together with Michael and Patricia, uh, Clayton and Todd for the next two years, whilst Michael would continue to receive income from his military pension. A large amount of income from the royalties of his novel, and he'd also now receive German state benefits as a result of being the guardian of the girls. It is again here that the word speculated uh, that Michael and Patricia now never legally adopted the girls for financial reasons, that they continued to raise them as if they were their own. So yeah, it's been speculation around whether or not they actually did adopt them or not. There was also a bit of a disagreement between Patricia and Michael about taking on two children as well, financially. Um, it's put a lot of strain on the marriage. In 1987, after more than 20 years of marriage, Michael and Patricia agreed to divorce. Patricia would cite that Michael was very quick to temper and could display moments of rage in a very physical way. She would also assert that he had been unfaithful, but no information was officially shared at this time, and it was put down to an amicable split. As a result, Michael moved back to America, where he purchased a house in Durham, North Carolina. He took Martha and Margaret with him, whilst Todd and Clayton remained with their mother in Germany, though both of his sons would later join him in America. There are additional allegations that during the time that Michael lived alone with Martha and Margaret in America, he became particularly unkind towards Martha. In the book Written in Blood by Diane Fenning, she makes numerous notes that both Patricia and Michael found it very difficult to raise Martha, whilst they regularly favoured Margaret. She also suggests that Patricia and Michael tried to offer Martha for adoption to their good friends, Jim and Mary Blair, uh, who were a couple that lived over in Texas. And basically they, they almost, they had everything lined up, but then they felt bad for separating the sisters and they felt like it wouldn't be fair on Margaret. So that's the only reason they didn't end up giving Martha away. In her book, she stated the following. Mike displayed a clear favoritism for Margaret, who was a friendly, outgoing and intelligent girl. Martha was more shy and sensitive. She developed a fear of Mike, hiding behind Barbara, the nanny, whenever she came to the house. Martha came home from the Petersons on a number of occasions with black and blue marks on her body, but Barbara overlooked it. Children often get bruised in play. She also alleges the following incident, which shows a concerning insight to Michael's demeanor. Then, Barbara went away for a week and left the girls with the Petersons. When she returned, Martha had two black eyes and blue marks behind her ears. This time, Barbara confronted Mike about what happened. He had said that Martha was a bad, bad girl and she needed to learn manners. Barbara swore Mike's voice was filled with glee when he told her that he'd rubbed Martha's nose in the carpet like a dog when she'd wet the floor. Soon after that incident, Mike Peterson moved back to the States, taking Margaret and Martha with him. This is the kind of thing that isn't mentioned within the documentary and it does very much paint Michael in there. Very different light, doesn't it? So, mm. I think because he is so quirky, and obviously in the back end of the documentary, he seems quite frail. It's so hard to imagine him like this. I even find it hard to imagine him in the military. Mm. But that was really jarring to learn about that. I mean, I don't know if there is the right language, but he does. He does come across as quite regal and like I don't know, like old money kind of guy, like mm. old values, very like instilled that kind of thing. But yeah, that's obviously absolutely disgusting if he was to do that to a young girl or anyone but yeah uh, it's definitely 
makes you question things. In 1988, whilst working on his second novel and also taking up work as an opinion columnist in the local newspaper, Michael struck up a romantic bond with one of his neighbours, Nortel Telecom business executive Kathleen Atwater. Kathleen was also a single parent, having a daughter called Caitlin, and the pair were similarly ambitious, with each of them being heavily interested in their careers, politics, law and community affairs. With the blended family now having five children from three separate couples before Michael and Kathleen eventually got married in 1997. So a note to mention around a similar time frame here, which is often mentioned in other documentaries or articles, is that Mike's eldest son, Clayton, was arrested in 1994 for planting a pipe bomb at Duke University. Which <laughs> is quite a big thing. A pipe bomb, it's not like a cherry bomb or when you flush and just it's a pipe bomb is extreme. Apparently Clayton had lost a fake ID that he wanted for a spring break and so he planted a homemade pipe bomb by one of his administrative buildings in order to form a distraction whilst he stole $1,500 worth of campus equipment capable of printing ID cards. Mm -hmm. Which is such an elaborate thing to do, like just because you want to get pissed. An article in News and Records stated the following. As Clayton left the administration building, he lit the fuse to a small pipe bomb submerged in a quart jar of gasoline. He also left a note in the building's basement that condemned administrators for prohibiting kegs of beer at the campus parties. Which is ironic, as Dukes had already held him back a year as a result of a drunk driving charge. When the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosive later searched the Peterson home, they found six more assembled explosive devices hidden in the attic. He was laying pipe. That's not mentioned at all. When they, because I watched it over Christmas, and when they interview Clayton about his dad, he said, "You know, I wasn't the easiest kid growing up. Um, I, I once wrecked his car, which I assume maybe was this drunk driving charge that they reference." But there's no mention that he lit a pipe bomb at uh, this his is all former used university. To me, yeah, mm. and they found six more explosive devices in the Peterson family home. Yeah, so that was a bit, a bit odd. Yeah, Clayton was only 20 at the time and he was sentenced to serve four years at a local federal penitentiary. And again, as I said, they, they interviewed both Michael's sons as part of the Staircase documentary and they are, they are very open uh, about their upbringing. They did say that Michael was strict and he, that he did spank them but never struck them. And I believe it's Clayton, no, it's Todd that says that he once cracked the pair's heads together in order to discipline them. People argue that the staircase is, is, is very biased towards his innocence, but they also do, I don't know, but then mind you, if you've got a film crew and you're, you're trying to defend your father, but they ask you, you know, was he ever violent to you? I think they were pre preparing for the trial and these types of questions may be thrown at them, but they were still both honest that he had been, you know, physically aggressive to them in their childhood. I think that as well, not uh, dismissing it, but in the sense of that, their age and how old they would have been, that kind of thing of, you know, spanking your kid and whatnot was much more of a thing back then. I think even yeah. when we were kids, it wasn't like looked at as badly as it is now. And also the thing about the documentary is they originally wanted to have access to both the prosecution and the defense. And essentially the prosecution would later on go, nah, she, nah, we don't, want, we yeah. don't, we don't want to be part of this. So then they only had access. I know people say staircase is very biased, but you can't really not be biased because you're only getting access to that one side of things and you're only going to hear those arguments they do obviously interview the prosecution as well uh, at times but it's not as half as much access as they were given to that side and i think as well and maybe again i'm viewing this slightly biased but the prosecution do come across quite smug in some sections that they do have access to so they were having sort of they do interview them between trials and stuff which we'll, we'll go into but yeah the, the the lead prosecutor um and the associate prosecutor both come across they're very both easy to dislike mm, i found it's, 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 i think this is a common thread isn't it when you like look at making a murderer it's oh, like the, the, yeah yeah. The, yeah exactly and the defend the defend lawyers always you always they always seem very charismatic and full of uh, i don't know they're, they're very charming and like the lawyer in this rudolph is very likable yeah you can't help but then buy into it, think well if he's defending him then he must be innocent which is obviously a stupid way of looking at it but yeah, I think all the stuff about, I mean, to be fair, Clayton's wrongdoings, does that mean that Michael will go on to do it? It's kind of a bit of a, yeah, yeah. it's just murky in the sense that that's happening within his home. I think it's probably about as far as you can push that. That's true. I mean, if it was referenced in the documentary, people might just say, well, what does that have to do with Michael, as you, as you said? But I just think it's, it's, it's strange that it's not mentioned. Yeah. But it has no relevance to Michael. So... Why mention it? So I've just completely done myself. Well, he, there, so. he, he is made out of Michael's seed. He is. That's true. Never forget the seed, Ben. 
No. Then the apple maybe doesn't fall too far from the tree unless it's on a hill. During this time, Michael released his second novel, A Time of War, A Bitter Peace, which was also financially and critically successful, and earned him considerable wealth alongside his first bestseller. Kathleen was also highly successful in her own industry, so the pair were able to purchase a 9,500 square foot, five bedroom mansion in the heart of Durham that sat on a sprawling 3.4 acre lot in the Forest Hills neighborhood. It is a huge house. Massive, massive. I was surprised it only had five bedrooms. I was thinking the size that. of it. Yeah. Yeah, that is a bit it's odd. It's gigantic. Yeah, and the pair loved their life together. They loved their careers and they loved their family and they loved their home. They were described as totally compatible with one another, an extraordinary couple with all appearances and trappings of happiness. Trappings of happiness. It's nice, isn't it? They had smiles, they had laughter. All the trappings of happiness. Often spending their summer evenings together, watching the sunset and drinking bottles of wine by their swimming pool, as if anything could go wrong. Mm. Thing to mention as well is just, just to kind of big up Kathleen. Like, she was apparently like, a game changer within the industry. She's one of the people at, at her university, she's the first person to get an a en engineering like scholarship. She was so successful that they even named a meeting room after her in, within the company, which is, you know, sounds odd, but it was, she was a huge part. And uh, yeah, the people, the neighbors loved her. She had a great reputation within the kind of local community, which you, Michaels was more of a mixed bag. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and you had to take anything he said with a pinch of salt, whereas she, from all that we, are able to attain about her was very genuine. Yeah, to have a meeting room named after yeah. you, that's the, that's the dream. I mean, I, also after all of this, my original thing Dan saying earlier on about how I think he's quite <laughs> genuine. Uh, <laughs> I'm starting to regret that. Uh, but there you go. Yeah, a uh, meet, uh, meeting room, that's, that's the dream, isn't it, Ben? The Ben Carter meeting room. Yeah. Maybe it's just the Ben Carter toilet block. I'd take it still. Yeah, you would, yeah. you bloody bugger. In 1999, Michael released his third book. I nearly said third book because I've got toilet on the brain now. <laughs> in 1999, Michael released his third book, this time a biography, and he was actually a, a co-writer on this project, and it was called Charlie Two Shoes and the Marines of Love Company. But it was far less successful than his previous efforts. And following on from this, his opinion columns for the Herald Sun started to become more controversial, often pointing criticism towards the Durham Police Department, local politicians, as well as Durham County District Attorney James Hardin Jr. Hardin Jr. Did I say it wrong? Oh, uh, Hardin Jr. Oh, yeah. Ooh. James Hardin Jr., who will I'm unfortunately... Saying, yeah. <laughs> as well as Durham County District Attorney James Hardin Jr., who will, unfortunately for Michael, feature later in the case. Michael's often venomous criticisms allegedly made him a lot of enemies in the local area. Yeah, he was, he was very critical of the police, the, the local politicians, and yeah, particularly James Hardin, and yeah, this will all come back around to him. So Michael was also uh, very quick to call out racism and he made a point of um, stating that these housing projects, these beautiful housing projects that had been built were never actually used, which was a waste of taxpayers' money. So he was, yeah, very critical and yeah, this did not paint a target, but it did certainly make him a lot of enemies in the local area. Stop racism! Following this, Michael decided to run for mayor of Durham, and despite his campaign initially getting off to a very good start, it would soon prove to be a disaster. His military credentials were questioned in a very public manner, and it was revealed that Michael hadn't been telling the whole truth about his experiences at war. His credibility was massively undermined when it was revealed that his Purple Heart was actually the result of a car accident in Japan and not in combat as he had claimed. He also told stories of how he had been hit by shrapnel when another soldier stepped on a landmine in front of him, and he had also stated that he had been shot, however none of this could be evidenced or backed up by any military or medical records, and it was revealed that he actually was stationed as a military policeman rather than a soldier. He had spanned the yarn slightly in his books and in what he had told people had happened over in Vietnam and Japan. However, military files later verified that he did receive the Bronze Star Medal with Valor, but he did not receive and had lied about his Purple Hearts. Mm. So that's not great. As a result of this news, as well as the fact that many people now believed he had actually stolen his medals, because um, he did not have obviously the paperwork to back these up, he lost his mayoral campaign heavily. Michael would not work or earn any income in the next two years. 
At the same time, Kathleen was pressured into a possible redundancy in her high-paying executive role, and the family now began to forecast financial difficulties. Despite this potential redundancy, Kathleen continued to hold on to her high-level role, as well as her high-level life insurance that came with it. She had a policy worth more than $1.4 million, and the beneficiary was changed from her ex-husband, Fred Atwater, to Michael Peterson shortly after the pair married. So, uh, breaking news on this, Michael claims that she never signed it. Ooh. Which um, I learned from watching an interview of him on This Morning, where they really did grill him. And I was like, that's odd. And one of the, one of the things Philip was grilling him on was him hiding his sexuality from his wife, which, I mean, I think is very rich coming from <laughs> Philip Schofield. But, um, yeah, it was quite an odd. They, they're so scathing in when they're talking to him. And Michael's very like, hmm, yeah, yeah. And he just, he's so matter of fact when he's talking to them, he won't dodge any answer. And I actually think he wins them round. You can watch them slightly ease enough on him as it goes, but at the beginning, they're just very like, that's very convenient, isn't it? It's like, fuck He off. does the same <laughs> with, because um, <laughs> he must have done somewhat of a, uh, like a, a tour of, of different interviews because he did one with, uh, is it 60 Minutes Australia, the one that's yeah, usually really, that. really good? Dr. Phil as well. Dr. Phil, yeah. And they also, well, seem to warm to him. They weren't as scathing as, as uh, this morning, but... Things are, like, we'll get onto this a bit more probably later on, but I don't get why he's doing the... Because he's, he was doing that whilst the Colin Firth thing was coming out, essentially. It's got to be financial, hasn't it, for does him? He get, yeah, I was say, does he get paid per interview? You'd assume so. Probably get some kind of appearance fee, and maybe as well it's a case of this is coming out, but it doesn't, it's not telling the story in the right way. Here's my yeah, that's true. opinion on it. So it's kind of like a PR bit as well, but I just that must be so hard going on those things and think as well, everything you say is going to be scrutinised to the 10th degree. So, yeah. yeah. So Michael, having recently lost massive amounts of confidence in his writing with his reputation now blemished locally, found himself with a lot of time on his hands, but he would often remain at home instead of being out in public. The Herald Sun also dropped him as a columnist, which also added to the family's pressures. As a result, he began to immerse himself on a number of adult websites, all of which were homosexual or forums for straight men with homosexual tendencies. Michael would share hundreds of emails with individuals he met online, eventually meeting up in hotels with a select few. They were in a lot of debt, um, but they also owned a lot of property. His pension wasn't too bad from the army as well. And yeah, as we said, Kathleen, she still was able to hold on to her job. It was a bit murky in certain, in certain instances, but they weren't completely in the shit. I think like a lot of the thing, yeah. a lot of people's like motives for this thing is, oh, well, he really desperately needed the money. But, and also Margaret and Martha, obviously bringing them into the family again, it, it's, it's people, it's extra money the family having to pay. His two sons did rely on their money a lot from the family. Um, but Michael would ask um, some of Martha and Margaret's like other um, relatives who were, you know, doing very well, if they could help support with a bit of money towards their, their study. And they said, yeah, sure thing, here's some money. Like, so they weren't completely in the shit, they were getting support. And um, yeah, I don't think it's as much of a key thing as people like to make out. Yeah, I, I, I think if you, at any point in your life, write a bestseller, surely royalties, that keeps kicking in for a little while, no? Like a Christmas song. Yeah, I think, yeah. A bit like probably, a Christmas song. Maybe a little bit, yeah. Yeah. The book he wrote, Charlie Two Shoes, he, he co-wrote that with. He basically, there'd be a big film director had basically come up to him and the co-writer and said, we want to make this into a film. It's pretty much was good to go. And obviously that would have been a big cash injection into the family as well. So there was lots of things going on. Obviously he's, he's tarnishes his local reputation from lying about the, the Purple Hearts. But still, there was a lot of money to be made. And, you know, even downsizing the house. They weren't completely in crushing debt that meant you know he everyone was living like week to week kind of thing which people yeah. make out so some people have alleged that as a result of all of this his marriage and financial situation continued to deteriorate quite rapidly but again as tom said they had other properties they had other strings of income many people assert that it can be evidenced that they had more than one hundred and forty three thousand dollars of credit card debt whilst others have stated that both of them uh, were completely positive in their situation and that the relationship was still very healthy all of this would come to a crashing or highly coincidental climax during the early hours of December 9th, 2001. And it is here that we move to the timeline of the Staircase Killer. 
So we're going to start our timeline with Michael Peterson's description of events, and as we move into the subsequent trials and aftermath, we'll then put forward the state's contested description of events, which kind of seems to be the one that most of Kathleen's biological family and a lot of the general public believe in. Uh, and then we'll go on, obviously, to give our opinions on, on what happens in the cases, and there'll be a few twists and turns as we go into it. The late evening of December 8th, 2001, Michael and Kathleen Peterson, according to Michael, had been eating together and watching a rented blockbuster movie, American Sweethearts, in their living room. When the film finished, the pair took their evening to their entertainment room to share a couple glasses of wine by their bar. Michael claims that the pair consumed two bottles on this particular night due to the evening being unusually warm for December. Michael claimed it being between 15 and 20 degrees Celsius. The pair then took their glasses of wine outside down the garden to have drinks by their swimming pool. Michael states the following about what happens next. We were sat here by the pool. The dogs had come over. We were just talking and finishing our drinks and then she said, I got to go in because I got the conference call in the morning. And she started walking out that way towards the house. And I stayed right here by the pool. I don't think I said anything special to her. I certainly wasn't thinking this was the last time I was going to see her. I said goodnight and I'll be up a little bit later. And the last I saw her was when she was walking away. That's it. That was the last I saw of Kathleen alive. No, she was alive when I found her, but barely. <laughs> Michael claims to have had another glass of wine by himself before returning to the house almost an hour later. So that's, that's a long glass, isn't it? Or do I, am I just glugging it? He wanted to finish the cigar, apparently, and they take a while to smoke. Ah, okay. You are a glugger as well. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, big old I glugger, yeah. yeah. Guzzler. Guzzler and a glugger, uh, yeah. Oh, we've, already done G, we've already done GM, we? We have. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this particular time frame has always remained quite vague in terms of how long did he stay out by the pool for himself. Finish a cigar, finish a glass of wine. But at this point, it's well into the early hours of the following morning. Michael then returns to the house, and what he found when he entered the property was something beyond his darkest nightmares. Michael finds his 48-year-old wife Kathleen laying in a pool of her own blood at the bottom of their staircase. He finds her barely conscious, clinging on to what remains of her life. December 9th, 2.40 a.m. Again, the timeframes are quite vague in terms of how long Michael waited before discovering his wife and deciding to call 911. However, call records evidence that he first called them at 2.40 a.m., where the following conversation takes place. During the initial call, Michael said Kathleen was still breathing. After the first call was disconnected for unknown reasons, he called 911 again. This time, he said that Kathleen wasn't breathing. And the call, yeah, this is this is a big part of the case, uh, the call itself. A lot of people have said it seems very authentic. He seems genuinely panicked. They point out the fact that he says that his wife has had an accident rather than any mention of any kind of attack or um, intruder being in their house. It's what, I mean, what do you boys think of the call itself? I think when I first heard it, I thought it sounded very genuine. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of things I've heard in documentaries and podcasts I've listened about this case, some people go, oh, it's so fake, he's just putting it on and he's acting like, like oh, oh, oh my God, I did like you could put it on, but I think it seems pretty genuine. You can question why he hangs up and calls again, um, and also people always make a point about saying, he when they he gets a bit angry when they're asking about how many stairs she fell down. How many stairs was it? And it's like, he's like, I, I, I don't know, 15, 20, I don't know, get, come here. It's, but it's like, who the fuck knows? Like, yeah. who knows how many, like, I don't know how many stairs I have in my house. It's like, it, it just seems a, such a stupid question, but people say that that reaction was because, you know, he, did, he, he was so prepared for this phone call, but he wasn't prepared for that bit, so it annoyed him. It's like, oh, fuck off. Mm -hmm. Like, the only thing, like, which I, some people have said, I, I kind of agree with, is he doesn't mention all the blood, which is, we'll yeah. get into it, but it's a lot of blood. But I think it's fairly, you know, it, it's how you would imagine it. Unless he saw something, he's not going to say intruder or anything like that, because he, it's, that's as well. If he did say intruder, you'd then think he is trying to 
make. Yeah, that's true. I remember listening to that phone call for the first time in the documentary, and my immediate response was, this is weird. So it's interesting Ooh. you both say that it sounded quite you know, genuine and uh, genuine panic, but I, my, in my initial transient response was, he's overacting this, overegging it. And like some of the responses are like, when he goes like, what? Like that, <laughs> a certain question that he's asked. It just sounds very overegged and yeah, certain information is missing. And I get the stairs question, but you know, if, if, if I fell down the stairs or if somebody, if I found somebody at the bottom of the stairs, I could easily go, I don't know, you know, 10 stairs straight away. I could. Yeah, but what is he going to count? No, not, not the exact number, but you could just immediately say how, you know, how many meters or how, how far he's fallen. But you, just, but you seem to, you know, not answer that very well. I think if, if, like you've said, if he's very emotional and very volatile in his voice, mm. you could be accused of overacting and trying to cover something up. Whereas if he was very cold and composed and 15 stairs, mm. he sounded a bit psychopathic that way. Also, mm. but I think as well, one thing that plays into his favour is the fact that the first thing he says is his address, essentially, where if he's trying to do this and, you know, just so he has it on his side for when it people do question him, I, I, I don't know, it is, it's, it's, I mean, there's other things in terms of timings, which is more into question. Yeah. And other things were found within, you know, the crime scene itself and in terms of timing and all that stuff, which is more, I think, I, I don't know, I, I don't think you can take a lot from the call. I don't think it's gonna, it doesn't make or break it either way. I know what you mean, Dan, and you could say him going, what? Could be um, <laughs> him just buying time to answer the question. Yeah. I do like that we all have slightly different opinions. Mm. I really like that. Mm. And I can mm. and the thing the thing about this is I don't disagree with either of you. And that's, that's the, the, the tricky with, thing about yeah. this case. The, but this this that call was the start of my journey of him being quite disingenuous. You know, that was the oh, first moment I, I was it. like, I don't I don't trust this guy. The only other thing he does mm. as well, which he over explains things when he's in normal interviews. Yeah. He'd be like, I sit now bottle of wine it's, it gets, gets really in depth on certain key points it doesn't matter mm. which well, is... that, yeah he was like I don't know if the chairs were exactly like this and then as, as when Dan read the quote as well he was like and that was the last time I saw Kathleen alive no she was alive when I found her but barely <laughs> it's kind of but I think that's just him I think you see it in these this little interview tour that he's done he is the same guy in all these interviews but it's very you're right <sighs> it, it could actually just be his character just over explains yeah. things a bit quirky and mm. maybe that's but is it. it a character he's playing or is it legitimately him I... yeah people use this phrase a lot but stranger than fiction is, is kind of very apt when it comes to this case i think in terms of just we're going to go into a big part of the case which is like what if people don't know this case you're going to be like it's a quite a damning wah? quite a damning uh twist it's definitely that call itself will immediately split people immediately. Police and ambulance are quick to respond and arrive at the scene not too long after the phone calls. Michael's youngest son, Todd, also arrives at the scene. However, he refuses to give any statements to the police. When they entered the property, they found Kathleen surrounded by a large pool of blood, as well as a lot of blood that appeared to have smeared across the lower walls. Though she was exactly how Michael had described her, apart from he didn't really mention the blood, but some officers believed that she had been laying there for more time than Michael had initially suggested, as a good amount of the blood was already dry. By this time, Michael had also cradled his wife numerous times, and so his shorts and shoes appeared to have blood spatter and blood smears on them. However, his shirt appeared to be completely clean. Investigators also noticed a bloody boot print on the back of Kathleen's trousers that seemed to match Michael's shoes. And whilst Kathleen's bare footprints can be seen in amongst her pool of blood, she now had flip-flops on. That's not good for Michael. I don't, why would you then put flip-flops on her? I don't know. Well, this leads into one of the more outlandish theories about the case, the flip-flops thing. I don't think you can go, he created her to try and make this scene, crime scene harder to read because if you, you know, it's your wife and if she's dying in your arms, you're not going to just sit there and go, I can't touch you just in case this is a crime scene, so I'm not going to show any emotion to you. And that's another thing for getting off the phone call. If, you, if your partner's there, perhaps dying, maybe you don't want to be on the phone call to the police when she passes away. So it's like, I can kind of get that. But um, yeah, and we're, we're going to go into all the different theories and all the different bits of evidence as we go. But Michael said that Kathleen must have slipped and fallen to her death on the stairs under the influence of alcohol. And she also had Valium and another, um, there's another drug within the system uh, which she was taking just to aid her sleep. She was, just, she was prescribed muscle relaxers after she actually had an accident within the pool. She jumped into the, the, the shallow end of the pool and um, it actually resulted in an injury before. So she was prescribed muscle relaxants to help her kind of sleep and trying to get over that injury. So she had a bit of Valium and alcohol and this other drug within her system, which mixed with alcohol, you know, it is 
who knows how, what kind of effect that would have. The medical examiner who examined her body at the scene concurred the death was probably an accident, but that narrative would later begin to shift. The toxicology report would reveal that Kathleen had a blood alcohol level of 0.7% and confirmed that she had taken between 5 and 15 milligrams of Valium. So Dan's just going to give us a bit of an overview here in terms of blood alcohol percentages as well as uh, the combination uh, or the dangerous combination of also taking Valium at the same time. Blood alcohol of 0.10 to 0.12 will show obvious physical impairment and loss of judgment. Speech may also start to be slurred, whereas between 0.13 to 0.15%, at this point your blood alcohol level is quite high. Gross motor impairment, loss of judgment and perception can also be severely impaired. 0.5 to 0.7, which is Kathleen's level, is generally considered tipsy or buzzed. Relaxation, euphoria, lower inhibitions, minor impairment. This, together with her Valium intake, anything over 10 milligrams can make you dizzy, tired, or even have blurred vision. It would have been an unwise mixture to consume. It's advised not to drink alcohol at all whilst taking Valium. And, she, and also, like to point, like, she also was going through a lot of stress this time with the stuff that happened at her work. I think she had quite a key meeting as well the following day that she had to be on and you can understand why maybe she was using some self-medication as well just to try and ease her stress and her worries there and also trying to help aid her within her sleep. I also did do a quick look boys um, on how long it, uh, my search history is not great here, how long does it take blood to dry and depending on the volume obviously there was a lot of blood at this scene and also depending on the temperature of the room itself uh, it will typically dry between 30 and 60 minutes although this was this is for a small amount of blood this mm. amount was probably at least double that so yeah it's not great. So during a post-mortem examination, the coroner concluded that Kathleen had died from injuries that were consistent with blunt force trauma, not an accidental fall. The autopsy report stated that she had sustained a combination of severe and varying injuries, including seven lacerations to the top of her head, a fraction of the superior cornea of the left fluoride cartilage, multiple small abrasions and contusions to the face, contusions to the back posterior arms, wrists and hands before eventually confirming that she had died between 90 minutes to two hours as a result of blood loss from the injuries. So the person doing that was is Deborah Radish and she'll be a big part of it in this case. She says a lot of things which is not really her position to say, which would very much could like sway a jury saying, I think this was like, well, it's not your job to think that. Your job is to say just this part of it. So she's quite a uh, mischievous little doctor. Initially, all of Michael's family stood by him and his version of events, including Kathleen's biological sisters and only daughter. So police detectives then began to comb the rest of the house as well as Forest Hills neighborhood, together with canine cops in search of evidence of a possible intruder. None canine of which... dogs, mate. Sorry. What did I say? Canine cops. <laughs> canine cops. <laughs> Together with canine police dogs, in search of evidence of a possible intruder, none of which could be found, the news broke on local news stations for around the following morning, with both individuals being well known in the area and Michael being a known novelist. The only thing to mention as well is the police didn't really handle the crime scene very well themselves. It's similar to John Bonet, neighbours came in, police were walking around the area, like it wasn't kept well. There's also mention obviously towels that Michael had underneath her head, which he said was there to you know, make it more comfortable, but police or some people think that he was doing it in order to try and clean, clear the crime scene. Yeah, there's lots of things going on within the crime scene there. It wasn't, it wasn't kept clean and as, 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 you know, as well preserved as it should have been. Michael remains adamant that he had nothing to do with the death of his wife, but many locals found this hard to believe as a light began to shine on the darker elements of his past and his secret present day life. So we're gonna go into the elements of his past in a little bit. But yeah, the other thing is the ambulance, apparently the paramedics would say that he seemed, you know, in shock. He was acting exactly how you'd imagine someone to be in that stage. He wasn't doing anything suspicious. He was just walking around, pacing, didn't know how, how to, to handle this. And he was distraught by the whole the whole thing. So again, that could be all be him playing, playing his cards very well, but yeah, it's just their eyewitness of you of it. Well, it was his son as well that was at the scene but refused to give a statement, said as he was arriving and he saw ambulances in the driveway, he, he had feared that his dad had had a heart attack or yep. something like that. He had nothing in his mind could comprehend that something had happened like that to Kathleen. I mean, the family have a bit of a weird relationship with the police, so I can understand why he didn't yeah. want to do that, didn't want to talk to them. And also, with his, we'll go into it with some of Michael's um, uh, writing in the newspaper as well, being quite negative towards the police. Um, they kind of immediately knew that this is going to be yeah, it's not going to be a smooth 
uh, period of time. So December 20th, 2001, 11 days after the fact, Michael is indicted for Kathleen's murder. He voluntarily surrenders himself to police shortly after the indictment despite his children's pleas, and he is taken into police custody. Upon surrendering himself, he quotes Shakespeare to local press outside the police station. Kathleen was my life. I've whispered her name in my heart a thousand times. She is there, but I can't stop crying. I would never have done anything to hurt her. So all of Michael's children initially stood by him and defended him as he proclaimed his innocence, and it was actually spearheaded by Kathleen's biological daughter, Caitlin. However, she would later make the decision to break away from the rest of the family, as did Kathleen's sister, Candice Zamperini, aligning themselves with the prosecution. Uh, and there would be different reasons as to why they did this, including uh, Michael's present life, as well as information about his life back in Germany. A little less than a month after his indictment, Michael posted bail for $850,000 through the financial support of his brothers, and he was released from jail to await trial. There's a lot of money in it for the bail. That's, yeah, a lot of money. February of 2002. Whilst awaiting trial, and as he had now become the prime suspect for his wife's alleged murder, Michael and his family pieced together an incredibly strong defence team, including attorneys David Rudolph and Tom Mayer, retired detective and private investigator Ron Garrett, forensic pathologist Dr Werner Spitz, and blood spatter expert Henry Lee. The team focuses on the theory that Kathleen's death was an accidental fall rather than any kind of third party involvement. And that's the thing as well, and it will come up throughout the timeline, there was no murder weapon or potential murder weapon in sight anywhere internally or externally on the location. And yeah, obviously they've already spent a large amount of money on getting Michael bailed. They would now have spent a huge amount of money on putting together this team. They would also run mock juries, which I can't imagine was cheap. So significant amounts of money are now coming out and people have suggested that Michael may have used, as he was the beneficiary, he may have used some life insurance money in order to cover these fees. So the defense actually based this argument on the blood spatter in the staircase and surrounding walls being consistent with an accidental fall down the stairs. But what they suggest is not a fall from the top of the stairs to the bottom, they actually are suggesting that she's trying to make her way up the stairs but has fallen backwards suggesting that Kathleen slipped numerous additional times whilst trying to get back to her feet, injuring her head and body in the process against the coving and the door frame surrounding the staircase. They argued that she would have continued to slip on her blood and this would have caused numerous smears and spatters rather than a blunt force attack. So there, yeah, there's no blood at high parts of the walls or on the ceiling, which they're suggesting if there was a weapon or a blunt force instrument used as the um, weapon went back up from the strikes, there would be spatter over the higher parts of the walls and the ceiling where they couldn't find any. The defense team also reviewed 257 deaths that were caused by blunt force trauma um, and that also had occurred in the same state, all of which had confirmed skull fractures or damage to the brain. Kathleen had neither of these things. So yeah, as Tom said, Deborah Radish's uh, opinions and testimonies were very much called into question by the defense. That's a big one there because if it was a fit of rage or if Kathleen had maybe found out about him messaging these people on these on these websites and they had a big argument and they fell out and he was smacking her in the head. It's like, yeah, so the, the blood splatter doesn't really lead to that. And also, if you can't hit someone delicately enough to essentially kill them without doing the stuff to the brain, like you have to be such a weird swing. And it was very unrealistic that that was the case, essentially. Well, that was it. And then the without a weapon, they're suggesting that maybe he could have banged her head against the wall and the stairs, but the, the wounds did not line up with that. And also that would have caused either a fracture or significant mm. damage to the brain, which she had neither. Yeah. So that's more why I'm leaning towards Innocent Dan in terms of this part of it. But there is so much still to, to go in terms of why, they, why he could be guilty. I mean, they then uh, said from that that essentially that the weapon had to be something that was hollow and light enough to hit which we're going to get into what the weird um, implement is that you never find on a Cluedo uh, yeah. board because it's such a niche, niche thing. Um, but yes, we'll get into that. So in analysing Kathleen's wounds, uh, the defence contested the opinion of the medical examiner, Deborah Radish, who had concluded that Kathleen had died from lacerations of the scalp caused by a homicidal assault. It suggests that lacerations to Kathleen's head and body were not all consistent with blows of any sort due to the fact there were a complete lack of underlying injury, such as bruising, swelling, any kind of bone fractures or hemorrhaging of the brain. During the same month, French filmmaker Jean-Xavier de l'Estrade and his crew began following Michael, his family and his legal team and filmed their movements in preparation for and during their trial. That French filmmaker is an award-winning documentary maker. They wanted to basically do, as I said earlier, 
a whole conclusive look at the American uh, judicial system from both sides. They originally were given access to both, but then uh, the uh, prosecution said no, and it was just following the defense. So this uh, footage was go on to form the now renowned series uh, on Netflix, The Staircase, though it was initially given to French network Canal Plus. So yeah, Michael was actually very keen. I think he led the um, the defense in terms of saying, yes, I want this to happen, just because he wanted to document everything that was going on. He was very wary about the police, as we said. So he wanted to have everything as he could to, to prove his innocence. So a lot has been said as well with about the staircase and then the bias uh, that it has, as Michael would enter a relationship with um, the editor of the film, Sophie Brunet. But apparently when he entered the relationship, the, the, the um, episodes that she had edited was only the first four episodes of the series and they were already edited before she started talking to Michael. So people saying that she changed the way she was editing it, I don't think it's, it can be true. Another editor took, uh, would then take her place in doing the edits for the, for the documentary. And, you know, um, Michael made the point of saying, you know, it's questioning their, you can't question their integrity. Uh, Jean Xavier and, and Sophie, they're professionals. She basically felt a connection to him whilst doing the editing and then would go see him later on when he was incarcerated, which we'll go on to. So I think that's a bit of a week. Originally had the HBO series framed it, made it seem as if they're very much together during all the editing um, and that is not quite the case. July 2003, the trial begins with intense media coverage focused on the prosecution's theory that Peterson had incurred a vast amount of debt, encouraged his wife's life insurance policy and was a closet bisexual, had bludgeoned his wife to death in a fit of rage. The trial lasts several months, during which time a lot of intimate details about Michael's private life comes forward. The trial calls various forensic experts, family members and even former male lovers of Michael's to testify, whilst the defence continues to argue that Kathleen's death was indeed an accident. So during this trial as well, it's it does take, like we said, a lot, a lot of twists and turns. And during the trial, a big key story from Michael's past was about to come into play. I kind of think, like, I probably should tell your lawyers about this. But yes, a big thing would come back and would take us all the way back to West Germany and to the death of Elizabeth. On the morning of November 25th, 1985, the Ratliff family nanny, Barbara Malanino, entered the family home to a scene that was absolutely horrifying in nature. She found 43-year-old Elizabeth Ratliff laying on the bottom steps of her staircase, surrounded by blood spatter and a pool of her own blood. The nanny immediately called police and ambulance services, though Elizabeth was pronounced dead at the scene. German officials declared the incident an accident and believed that she had died of an intracerebral hemorrhage as a result of an existing blood disorder that she had, and this particular blood order was known as von Willebrand's disease, though many people and even the local media believed her to have been killed as a result of a homicidal assault. And this is where it gets quite interesting. Uh, Michael Peterson was supposedly the last person to have seen her alive. The Peterson family had had dinner with her the evening before. However, he wasn't questioned further and was even granted guardianship of her two daughters who had lost both their mother and father within a two year period. Uh, so this is obviously where Ma Michael now takes guardianship of Martha and Margaret. Barbara Malagnino, the nanny, later recalled the following. I looked around and there was a lot of blood on the floor. There was a lot of blood on the walls. I could not believe what I was seeing. It was unusual for there to be that much blood. There was blood all over the house, and I would find more spots and smears around the house days and even weeks later. So for anyone who doesn't know this case, this is the big turning point in the case in terms of people going, what the fuck? And yeah, people saying that Michael did it because basically they were very close to the families and um, you know, Michael could have known that you know, if anything was to go wrong, he would receive their inheritance, which apparently wasn't a large amount of money. Uh, it certainly wasn't enough to um, be able to care for and raise two children from a very young age because the girls were very young at that age as well, uh, young at that time as well. Well, there's such a niche thing to happen, people dying from falling down the stairs, ha and this happening around in suspicious circumstances, twice with Michael Peterson being around, it's very, very fishy to say the least. The only thing I would say, and I'll put to you guys, is if you're gonna commit a crime and kill people, would you do it by pushing them down the stairs? Because it's not guaranteed that they're gonna die, is it? No, no, I wouldn't feel confident in my push nor the fall. And the, head, the head's going to have to hit something hard enough in order to do that, which would, which it wasn't, wasn't proven that, that was the case. I think if I had to push someone down the stairs, I'd feel quite confident. Go on, but then. I, Clip I, that up. I, <laughs> I see what you're saying, Tom. Yeah. Do you want some stats, boys? Do you want some stats? I'd love a stat. I'd love some stats. Yeah. So unfortunately, St I don't have. Case. Yes. Ben Carter's statistics. <laughs> I like stats. <laughs> 
Perfect. Welcome back, uh, BC's interesting stats. So I couldn't actually find them for Germany, but I have got them for America. And the fact that this has now occurred twice uh, in the circumference of Michael is, is quite interesting. So on average in America, there are over 12,000 deaths per year caused by falling downstairs. Ooh. But that only equates to 0.003% of the population dying from falling down the stairs. And it's obviously happened twice around Michael. A further 43,000 are hospitalised as a result. And according to oddsofdying.com, your lifetime odds of dying from a fall down the stairs in the US are 1 in 1,523. They're not that big. Which I didn't think that was mm. that bad. The question is here, like, you got, you got, I'm sorry, I was going to use the C word there, but it's very unnecessary. You get people out there who um, win the lottery twice. You do. And you don't go, oh, that's fishy. The guy, or the Australian like guy that did it on camera, he went, he won a load of money on a scratch card and then they were filming him at the shop and he scratched it off and he won even more oh, than yeah. that the second time. That. Yeah. yeah. So that the thing, like, it's not completely out of the question. And as well, I mean, we've just done Ben's stats. His new new uh, segment called Benny Benny Statistical Satchel. Um, but we're going to go over to Tom's tepid take. Ooh, Tom's tepid take. Temperature that hot. So this is slightly less of a hot take. It's more of a, it's more me against the kind of you know the keyboard warriors and the people kind of trying to make something out of nothing really one big kind of key like thread that people join these two two um, cases in crimes with or two accidents with is a certain painting which sat at the bottom of the stairs le chat noir which dan that translates as the black cat it does indeed yeah it's it's a famous painting it's it's not too odd for that to be in the household it is assumed that the, the painting is actually the same one from one house to another but the reason why this is such a and basically this painting was at the bottom of the stairs in each house this that's the big the big point so the reason why people think oh well this is actually a lot more to it than you actually think is the edgar Allan poe uh, story the black cat obviously with michael peterson being a a bookworm a, a novelist a studious kind of guy was this, in fact, a little, clever little uh, dick he's taking at people and also just trying to be, like, very, like, um, poetic with with with, uh, with these deaths? Big shout out to the, the series of Fall of the House of Usher. They actually do this story as well. But it's the Edgar Allan Poe story, The Black Cat, which essentially is there's a black cat which torments this person who he, he ends up to kill the cat and then uh, it comes back again and he, he goes to kill the cat again and he ends up killing his wife. So it's a story about guilt and hiding. He hides a body behind a brick wall and it's hiding the murder of his wife and being very like coy with the police and things like that. So was this in fact Michael playing a game with people, leaving a little puzzle piece and being like, will people be able to solve this? And uh, yeah, linking it with Edgar Allan Poe. But I mean, I've heard some podcasts saying that it's it's a story from Edgar Allan Poe where some, a woman dies on the stairs. It's like, that's not what happens at all. It's, he kills his wife with an axe in the story. So it's like, it's not linked to as that. It's a common picture. It's not weird to put a picture at the bottom of your stairs. I think maybe as well, seeing the original painting at the bottom of the stairs, you might think, oh, that's a good place to put it, put it there. I, I think people are put far too much into this idea that he's a mastermind and he's playing everyone with this, this, this cat. But as well, it's just a very popular painting and I just think people just need to chill out on it. It's a, it's a lovely little idea that he's doing, that leaving breadcrumbs, but... I think people need to just chill out a bit on that. So my tepid take is just chill out. Good shout out of the, the fall of House of Usher as well. I thought I watched that over Christmas intertwined with the staircase, bizarrely. I thought it was very good. It was very good. And yeah, all Edgar Allan Poe stories within that. Very good. Mm. But yes, um, so it's a, that's a thumbs down from me, guys. And just maybe just <laughs> stop reading all those stories. Anyway, back to the case. Don't really actually carry on reading because they're good stories, but chill out. So there is a great deal of controversy and varying opinions surrounding the death of Elizabeth Ratliff, including eyewitness testimonies that state they saw Michael running from the property. They also say that Michael had a contradictory version of events in, in retelling uh, Elizabeth's death, and also criticism of the German medical examiner, as well as the autopsy that was conducted. And apparently it was this German examiner's 
first ever autopsy. There were also beliefs from close friends of Elizabeth that she had been complaining of severe headaches in the weeks building up to her death and many believe that she may have suffered an aneurysm or a stroke before falling down her staircase. And so basically, with all this kind of coming out uh, during during the, the court case, they got to exhume Elizabeth's body and actually transport it to the US, or to be sort of the brain to the US to be studied. And they did go on to find out that she did in fact suffer from a stroke. Yeah. So that again, it wasn't overly publicized, especially when people are trying to paint it in certain ways. It does appear that she did suffer a stroke and fall down the stairs, which in my head, that does rule out I mean, Michael couldn't make that happen. Another thing that people go down a lot is, is the idea that him having an affair and Margaret in fact being his child because she looks a lot like one of his sons. But apparently that's been proven as well that that's not the case. It's not, the one of the children is not, not his children and people like to dig that up and keep saying, well, they look so alike, look at the pictures of them. But it's been yeah. proven that it's not the case. So yes, I think that one is, of course, straight away, you're like, well, fuck? as soon as you hear it, you're like, okay, fuck it, he's guilty. Yeah. He's obviously guilty. Um, but then when you look in the finer details of it, it's not as clear a cut as that. And I mean, as well as this being uh, something that came out in the trial and was really used as a tool against Michael, the other thing was his sexuality. So they basically went through uh, personal emails of Michael's and entered that into evidence to essentially suggest that he was having an affair with another man and um, that he was uh, essentially cheating on Kathleen without her knowledge. That would be argued very much. However, Assistant District Attorney Frida Black, and again, she's... Um, had her critics throughout this series but she wasn't um, as forthcoming with the film crew to, to, to be as involved with their production as, as the defence were but she made the following statement outside of the courtroom when it first came to light that Michael had had an affair. Kathleen would have been infuriated by learning that her husband, who she truly loved, was bisexual and having an extramarital relationship, not with another woman, but a man which would have been humiliating and embarrassing to her. We believe that once she learned this information, that an argument ensued and a homicide occurred. So on that, basically, there was evidence to show that the computer had been used that night um, on her way on her journey, basically, to go up the stairs. She'd gone to the computer. She did have a meeting locked in for the next day, um, and she was gone on her computer, and it's shown that she logged in, etc. And people believe that perhaps there was some porn or email on there that she saw of, Mar of Michael's and then she basically confronted him and that's how everything spiralled. A lot of people say Michael would never never let her go in his office and use the computer, that would never happen, but then she had her own login on the computer so it'd be very odd if, <laughs> if that was the case. Basically uh, they were starting to use Michael's sexuality as a blowpoke to beat him with. Ah, very good, mm. very good. What's a blowpoke? We'll, we'll tell you. We'll, we'll tell you, we'll tell you. So the defence would counter this claim by stating that Kathleen was fully aware of Michael's sexuality and that they remained in a very happy, open marriage, regardless of Michael's other relationships. And this was actually reinforced by family members, including Michael's own children, when they testified. And yet that was one thing the prosecution couldn't really do. They couldn't call into question the fact that he was a good parent, the fact that he was a good husband. And the, yeah, the prosecution couldn't even get Kathleen's sister to sort of call into question his abilities as a, as a parent or a husband. Everyone said they were completely in love um, and a, a really happy couple. So I'd, I'd say they'd have all the trimmings of happiness. Trimming is so nice, isn't it? Trimmings of happiness. Wasn't it trappings? No, but I'm saying, I'm saying trimmings. <laughs> all right, sorry. But I'd also say they also have all the trappings of happiness. But um, yeah. <laughs> So the blow poke that Tom's, uh, that Tom's mentioned. So this was a huge moment as well. Now the blow poke is essentially a f fire poke. It's a, it's a hollow fire poke where you can blow in it to then make the, um, you know, in engulf the flames a little more. I know you're not very handy with a fire, Ben. But, I'm not, no. But Dan would love it. It's basically what I did to your hot tub, blowing into Ooh, the it flames. It is, yeah. You blew, you blew more than that, mate. <laughs> Bubbling away, brown. What? Is that Michael at the end there? <laughs> so basically, uh, a lot of the Peterson family had been gifted blowpokes. Um, and in Shit the Michael. Present. Yeah, really? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> You'd like that, would you? I'd quite like a blowpoke, to be honest with you. All right, well, I'll know for next time. <laughs> So, yeah, basically, uh, various members of the Peterson family had been gifted blowpokes and the Michael Peterson, Kathleen Peterson household had two blowpokes. However, only one of them could be accounted for. Now, the prosecution were adamant that this was the murder weapon and that the second one had been taken out of the house as only one of them could be found. It was heavy enough to do the damage, but not heavy enough to fracture the skull. So they believed. Yeah, yeah so they believed. 
and also i mean in in the staircase it's a it's a it has a slight wind to it so you go in and you sort of approach it this is very technical inwardly and then you turn to like a 90 degree angle to your right Yes, yeah, so basically, in this kind of house, in our, in our version now, you have the big main staircase, a big lustrous big main staircase. This staircase would have been essentially for the staff. It was like from the kitchen, a little like, little creepy one. So you go up the stairs, chuck a right, and then you're going up. So it goes a little spin around, but yeah. it's, it's not the big posh one. And as it spins, there's one slightly more narrow angular uh, step where it has kind of a fin tread to the right of it. Now they're suggesting that this weapon, even though it's a quite a long fire poke, it's about a meter or so long, could have still been lifted and uh, struck someone in that within that, the confines of that staircase, which again I find there was no spatter from. Yes, and that the, the, height. so Dwayne Diva, who get along with along with Radish, Diva and Radish, fucking useless, and we'll go into it. But he his theory was essentially, oh yeah, well the reason there's no blood splatter on the ceiling is between every hit he just wipes it, and then hits again, and that, in a fit of anger. You're not got your little hanky out and just wiping it. And it, it, as Ben was saying, in terms of the, the room there, you don't actually have a clear, you'd have to go like a very odd movement in your arm to not hit the ceiling. And then we all really slowly go up, smack down, but even that could cause spatter. It would be easier to stab with the blowpoke than to strike, which yes. is a grim image in itself, but. Yes, and, and Diva essentially, he was the one saying like, he claimed to be on multiple cases when it came to uh, people falling on the stairs and these kind of things. And also, we're going to go into exactly his digressions, which would lead to other things, but he would go on to do your tests to prove that using the blowpoke, you're able to get a splatter on the wall sufficient to match. And it was, it was like, I think over 200 tests he had to do in order to get it. And when they finally did, his team began, well, one of his team began dancing in yeah. celebration. Yeah, yeah. They're celebrating it, and I think it was to do with a bloodstain on the inner bit of Michael Peterson's shorts. Yeah. So essentially they're trying to hit this sponge, <laughs> this sponge with red liquid on, in a way that's going to make a little bit of blood come up and drip, drip up on the inside of the shorts. That part reminds me a lot of the detective in in uh, Making a Murderer who draws Steve, <laughs> draws Stephen Avery's mugshot and then's like, but they look the same. Yeah, he framed he framed his framing. Yeah, that's oh wow. So yeah, so so this blowpoke, they are adamant that that's the weapon, but it can't be accounted for. Now, weeks into the trial. The blowpoke is found and it's found by one of Michael's family members. The documentary crew are on hand when this happens and so they are also filming the moment that they so they do not they can evidence that it's not contaminated as they recover it. It's then evidence that the blowpoke is covered in cobwebs and dirt but no blood is found on the blowpoke. And it's also evidence that police who had actually photographed the scene um, had already photographed the area where the blowpoke was found and you can see the blowpoke in that photo. However, they never disclosed it to evidence. So mm. yeah, another key moment in this trial. Michael's team are, well, they're all jubilant when they find it. And you think that this is kind of case closed now, but uh, unfortunately, no, they would still continue. They thought they found the smoking gun, but it was a webby poke and the webby poke <laughs> didn't set them free essentially, which, yeah, it's, again, that was a big one. Like what the fuck that's happened? Like you didn't expect it to happen within the case. But yeah, it, it's, as we said, we're gonna go into Diva a little bit and his transgressions. So one of the male escorts that Michael was, was messaging at the time was, was brought to the stand and, and was questioned on the stand. He had gone to say that Michael would say, always talking about how much he loved his wife, uh, saying that she was she was dynamite, I think was the actual exact quote. And uh, this guy came across very, I think the defense thought he would be like, this will sh prove that, you know, Michael, they're trying to frame him as being a deviant and all this stuff. And it's basically just been very homophobic about the whole thing. And um, he was very charming. And he, he said he, afterwards, he'd gone to say he felt he actually was being used and badly treated by the, the prosecution. But he was saying basically kind of painted a picture of Michael loved his wife. He still had this feeling and urges towards men. But uh, he said he never had a client as as open about saying how much he loved his wife. So uh, that was an interesting uh, little twist in the tale as well. So the trial now goes on for the next four months and we arrive at October the 10th, 2003. After one of the longest trials in North Carolina history, the trial concluded with Michael Peterson being found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. He is offered the chance to give any kind of final remark uh, to the court where he opts to turn round and face his children before saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, to each of them. 
Following the trial, questions start to arise about the reliability of key forensic evidence and the conduct of the prosecution, including their expert witness, Dwayne Deaver. This leads to appeals and a further scrutiny of the case over the next few years. Michael is then incarcerated for the following seven years and we arrive at August 2010. Now, this is where everything comes into question in terms of Dwayne Deaver's conduct and the reliability of his testing and analysis. And it also comes to light that he has actually played part in hundreds of other cases wherein he has lied. So his, his uh, credibility is very much into question. And as a result, a new trial is ordered after Michael's conviction is overturned due to concerns about the misleading testimony and a new trial is ordered. It was evidence that Diva had lied in hundreds of other cases, conducted improper investigations, and had heavily manipulated his testing in order to achieve a blood spatter pattern that would incriminate Michael. So yeah, one of Diva's um, things was that basically, he, if he did find evidence that would lead to the other, he would basically just withhold the evidence from cases. There was an infamous case where a man was actually incarcerated for 18 years because there was some blood found on the front of his car, bumper essentially, and the body wasn't too far away and the man was then arrested, but the blood would actually go on to be proven to be an animal's blood. Yeah, so that was the case of Gregory Taylor, which is another heartbreaking case, and that one's a bit more, there's a bit more DNA evidence than there is in this one, or than there wasn't available with this one, but it uh, seems to be a bit more of a clean cut version, that case, than the staircase case. So he would basically manipulate things in order to make it fit the uh, prosecution's story and yes he as i said before he, he claimed to have been you know witness to or been part of cases with lots of people falling down the stairs all these things just basically lying and lying and lying and once people actually looked into it what he'd done it would then lead to a lot of cases being brought back to court and i don't think i don't think he even saw any prison time for all, all his offenses and lying which is absolutely ridiculous yeah it, like we said him celebrating <laughs> being able to do a test just to manipulate it is, is absolutely fucking ridiculous. But yes, he's one. He's definitely one of the. Um, it naturally makes you go fuck him, and then you back Michael a bit more. But it's still, yeah. yeah. And I think at the same time that this comes to light in the in the tr well in the documentary, obviously Michael's by this point spent seven years in prison. He's he's aging very quickly, isn't he? And he's 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 had grandchildren born while he's been incarcerated, and it's again maybe quite biased. You are starting to feel sympathy for him at this point because you see him. He's struggling to ironically, climb stairs. And this is where I mentioned before, because the, the documentary actually initially did go out, was released without the kind of follow-up, then it was all put together later on. In the original one, you hear Michael basically slagging off the sister-in-law, and yeah. then when they go back to trial, she basically <laughs> says to him, like quotes to him what she, he said about her, and it's like, oh fuck, it's like, oh Jesus. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's very interesting. So Daily Rudolph remains partially available to Michael's legal team, but only in an advisory capacity, as he'd been supporting him for several years pro bono. I mean, obviously, it costs so much money to kind of it, one of the high like high end lawyers, and yeah, it basically, is a long journey they've gone on together. 2011, over the next few years, the state's case against Michael becomes weaker and weaker, and it is revealed that leaked personal emails relating to another man Michael had, was having an affair with was illegally used as evidence. Micah enters an Alfred plea, allowing him to maintain innocence while acknowledging that sufficient evidence exists for his conviction. So yeah, this is basically a lot of people as well say, why would he admit to manslaughter or doing it if he's innocent? But much yeah. like the uh, Memphis Free, you'd yeah, either say, no, I'm going to stick to my story and remain imprisoned just for, you know, just to prove that I believe in this so much. Or do you think, fuck it, I've missed so much life. I haven't seen my you know kids grow up. I haven't seen this and this. And he, and he reluctantly said, OK, I'll do it. But he was very you know against the idea originally of, of doing that. So he subsequently released from prison, much to his former sister-in-law's dismay, having already served eight years of his sentence. Part of his release terms state that he must live under house arrest with a strict curfew, while also wearing an ankle tag tracking monitor, which he wears for the following two years and a half. Two and a half years. But that still works, technically, it's right. Exactly right, yeah. Two years and a half. <laughs> that is funny. I, I don't know if this was, as well, going back to the, the David Rudolph, because, again, very likeable, very charismatic. I don't know if this was me being quite gullible, but I found the fact that he had stuck with Michael pro bono and I really warmed to Rudolph. I thought that that was a sign in itself that I should believe Michael's innocent because Rudolph does. But then Rudolph is doing his job. But the fact that he did some of it pro bono kind of swayed me as well, which it probably shouldn't. <sighs> I think as well, by that stage, how much money Michael has paid for him, he might even yeah. just feel a bit like, and as well, over the time spent with him and the family and all that stuff, he might just feel like, you know, fuck it, I can 
he knows he's not going to be there a lot of time, like every day working on it, but he can just uh, advise because, yeah, they spent a lot of money by that stage. And then, yeah, there's also a bit of a stern word between him and Michael at one stage where Rudolph is essentially saying, I'm going to have to, you know, move on. And he's like, well, no, I like, you know, you've been from this the beginning. And he kind of begs him a bit, doesn't he, to be part of it. Yeah, I mean, it's as well. So Kathleen's uh, sister, Candace, um, was obviously, she was opposed to the idea of him ever being released at any point during this trial. She appealed and pleaded to each different judge to not let Michael out and that she feared for her own safety and Caitlin's safety if he was out on the streets. So she was a constant kind of fawn in the side of... Via bungalow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you've got the doorstep, but that's it. There's no, you know... Get a ramp. So she was obviously furious when... Um, when he was eventually released and she was a big part of the reason why he had to have that ankle bracelet on uh, for such a long time. A bracelet? Ankle bracelet, yeah. That's cute. Yeah. Tag. Yeah. I don't think I ever called it a bracelet. I think some people might. I'll Google it. You care? Okay. After search ankle bracelet, it just seems to be lots of like decorative like bracelets around the ankle. Electronic tagging, the use of ankle bracelets. Yes. I needed that. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, he's he's out now. Uh, uh, technically, a free man. He's obviously done a lot of uh, uh, press appearances, television interviews, in um, perhaps search of proclaiming his own story, but also maybe for some sort of financial relief. Obviously, the properties have all been sold off now. And yeah, I mean, it's it's a very divisive case. People have differing opinions in terms of a motive. Obviously, there are arguments that it could have been he had maybe a financial motive, but. There's obviously, as Tom said, they, they had other properties, they had other strings of income. There was no other motive really apart from that that they could really cling to, apart from he'd maybe engaged in an affair and was no longer in love with Kathleen. But again, that was disputed by family members and Michael himself. There's some theories. I mean, there's a, a lot of information about this case on Reddit. Some users have suggested that Michael committed the crime naked, showered and dressed afterwards um, and, and did it via slamming the back of her head into the staircase. Yeah. yeah, I don't really see that one happening. The other one that has come to light recently or in recent years is the barred owl theory. Now, this theory, it's a barred owl, not a barn owl. Um, so easy mistake to make and you let people off if they do make that mistake. But this theory suggests <laughs> if that... If they write a, wrongly, yeah. Yeah, this theory suggests that a barred owl, which were uh, very prominent in that particular area, had inflicted the initial wounds on Kathleen outside of the house and mistaken her for prey whilst she was outside for some reason at around 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, putting up a Christmas decoration. From the dramatization of it, she's essentially gone out to correct a bit of decoration that had fallen down, essentially. She went outside and just kind of moved it. I think it was like a, a reindeer of some sort. And then whilst doing that, the owl swooped down. Yeah, and so apparently the reason why this came forward is that they were very much um, present in that area at the time. There were apparently owl feathers and pine needles found amongst the crime scenes. So with that, so essentially the idea was she went outside to um, basically fix a bit of the decorations. No one really knows why, but that would make the most sense. And whilst doing that, the owls are known to sweep. It's not It's not as a crazy idea as people think. Sweep down and the actual lacerations on the back of the head, which if, if you see, it's quite shocking when you see them. Apparently they fit perfectly with the idea of talons going into the back of the head and, you know, it could cause a quite deep cut without without doing the fractures on the, on the skull. So um, the reason why people think that is, yeah, because the shape of the talons on there and they are, those owls are known to be around there at that time. But also there's minute feathers were found on her in her hair and in her hand, which that in itself is quite a weird thing to just have on you. It, it would obviously, you think there has to be some... I never thought I'd say the phrase altercation with an owl, but um, that's a very odd thing to happen. It would maybe it would explain she's walking up the stairs, she's lost a lot of blood whilst walking up the stairs, and then she slips on her own blood and falls down the stairs is the, is the theory there. And yeah, people are starting to believe that theory. Uh, it's not that the owl was in the house, it happened outside the house. And yes, it, it, apparently there's lots of attacks that happen from owls, more than you would actually think. Out of interest, was there actual legitimately sized owl feathers found or was it just the microscopic ones like you mentioned? I think they found microscopic ones as well amongst some of the DNA that was against the outer frame of the staircase door entrance where like a, a bit of impact had happened. Mm. I mean, I've just Googled the old barred owl Kathleen Peterson and there are diagrams of how it may have happened and they do kind of line up with the lacerations, mm. but because they are interesting 
oddly shaped lacerations. I would just expect more feathers. There was a large smear of blood on the outside of the front door frame as shown in the police photos, which would explain if the attack happened outside. There were drops of blood on the outside walkway leading to the front door of the house as well, which, to be fair, I was, I was thinking that would go against it, but there was blood found. Two wounds on the scalp, which is shaped in talons. Tiny wounds on Kathleen's face is consistent with the tip of an owl's beak. A feather was found, it says, says just says feather was found in Kathleen Peterson's body. And a twig was found in dried blood in Kathleen Peterson's body. Mm. Uh, there's numerous strands of Kathleen uh, Peterson's hair uh, with the roots indicated had been pulled out, not cut, found in dry blood on her hands. Mm. I know it sounds absurd, and at first I remember laughing about the idea of that, but it's more likely than Michael smashing her in the head or anything, which is a, th a thing, odd thing to, to think, but mm. yeah. So shall I add one more sort of throw one more sort of weird situation into this case although yeah. it's already had enough twists and turns so patricia peterson the first wife of michael and the biological mother of todd and clayton uh, so they actually uh, moved in together and they lived in a durham apartment uh, for many years in uh, michael's later life and her later life and sadly she died of a heart attack in 2021 now patricia's death however is surrounded by its fair share of uh, mystery and controversy after it was revealed by her son todd that michael had waited for over three hours before he called 911 after realizing that patty was sick but this wasn't at the point that she'd had a major heart attack Obviously, she was showing maybe symptoms, but he waited a long time to call 911. So again, people are speculating that he's allowed that to happen. But I think it was again just... Death does follow Michael Peterson. It does. Dan, any change in your stance? Well, I can't confidently suggest how, if he did it, how he did it. <sighs> but I just, I, just, I just see a load of narcissistic, perhaps psychopathic tendencies in him. And mm. I got that right from the start, right through the documentary. But perhaps just that's just my outlook on him. So, I, yeah, I can't say how, but I just don't. I just don't trust him. I think the Purple Heart singing alone makes you go get the question of his character in terms of being honest about things. I think it's the the reasonable doubt, isn't it? I don't think there's enough reasonable doubt there. There's no clear proof that he did it, but I don't think he's a completely innocent appearing guy is tricky i'm making my way towards that fence with you i can definitely see both sides and both opinions of this case going for the owl mm. are you the more i think about the owl the more i'm like i mean when you look into it it's not as elaborate as it initially seems mm. because it's quite a wooded area around there as well and as i said like if you look into the actual amount of tax i mean phil and holly were scoffing on, on this morning talking to him but then Peterson's like, well, no, yeah, there's actually thousands of attacks happen with owls every year. And it's like, you see lots of things on TikTok now, like magpies and things attacking people when they're walking down the street. So the thought of someone being late at night as well, being outside, swooping down, I don't know. If that was legit, I would just expect to see more of a messy, feathery, bloody remnants rather than mm -hmm. just bloody remnants. If you know but if I mean. the owls just swooped down, right, and gone on the back of the head and pecked the face and then flew off... If he's that efficient, then that's impressive, yeah. He, or she. <laughs> or she. <laughs> yeah, then if it was just a swoop down, because I, I mean, as, it might be like similar to a shark getting a, sur a surfer, like not knowing exactly what it is, and then attack and mm. then go, fuck, oh, it's not right. Not, it's not a mouse. Fly off. You know, it, it, it's, the feathers being there and the twig being there and then the hair being noticeably ripped out yeah. is yeah. a bit odd. Yeah. All their hunting as well, barred owls, um, is done during the night or twilight hours. You don't really see many owls during the day. No, no. And if you do, keep your distance. But uh, there you go. We want to know what you guys think. So let us know down below in the comments below on, on Spotify and on YouTube, of course. Let us know the theory you think. Was Michael Peterson uh, guilty? Was the owl guilty? <laughs> you, there you go. So, uh, yeah, that, that is the case. I, I, I don't really feel any closer to having a clear idea in my in my mind. And I don't think it's... I think it's a case that actually will never be properly solved. Yeah. I've left more confused. Mm. Which I do after most episodes, to be fair. But this one, yeah. I'm really not sure. Very to what? and fro. What? What? But yes, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we'll be back again next week. But Ben, it's time for your cryptic... Benjamin Carter's cryptic clues. Everyone gather round for some clues that can be quite cryptic, but he's going to give them to you anyway. Hope you can figure them out. Yeah, so this week's cryptic clue uh, for this week's case was uh, it's a case the more that you stare at, 
uh, the more you'll start to see different things. So it's quite an obvious one. I don't think many people will get this one, uh, Tom and Dan. I really don't. I'm, I'm quite happy with it. The cryptic clue for next week's episode is... That's a spooky one, Harry. See, I think that's one of your best ones. Oh, um, thank you, mate. Yeah, we're going a bit rogue with next week's case, so we're very we much are. excited to share that with you guys. And it is a spooky one, Harry. So very much looking forward to sharing that with you guys. Thank you so much for your support. We're very pumped to be back with the new series. And don't forget, if you guys are interested in going to CrimeCon, you can use our code 8 and check out and get 10% off. And we're very much looking forward to that. But also, if you're just like, oh, these guys, I like when they talk about true crime. I want more. Why not go over to www.icmap.co.uk, icmap.co.uk, and you can become a member on there. There's three different tiers, different things you can get from it. Get access to over 140-ish episodes, minisodes over there, audio and visual. And also, there's lots of merchandise over there. So if you want any of that, why not check it out? Absolutely. And we appreciate that times are, are quite tough at the moment. It would be absolutely amazing if you could just tell people about us. Pop us on your social media. Pop us in your story. Give us a shout out. I just tell your friends about us. Um, we'd really appreciate it. Because the more ears and the more eyes, the better, uh, I've been told. Definitely, definitely. Mm, and so, yeah, yeah, a little cheeky review, a little thumbs up on on, on YouTube. It, go, it goes further than you'll ever know. And yeah, we're very much pushing on YouTube stuff this season. Please, if you haven't already, give us a little cheeky subscribe. We're very much appreciated. And we, we've got a lot of juicy cases this, this, this uh, season. So be sure to stick around. But anyway, like we always say. We say this all the time. <laughs> doing. What you doing? Mm, yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, well, yes. Um, unless it's uh, lying about your purple hearts, see? Uh, not disclosing the pipe bombs. Yeah, don't do pipe bombs. Don't lay a big old fat pipe bomb. Yeah. It's Dukes. It's a nice place. Hangover guy that Dan likes. Mm, that's, that unnamed spaceman. Uh, anyway. Space astronaut. It's in the thing. Anyway, all the best. <laughs> See you later. See you later. Two pip.